So the highlight of the day, the one we've been waiting for, uh, it involves our, uh, our guest presenter. You need uh, a comic relief. And you know what, I may suggest, I may suggest before we get to that, well, let, me, let me do the introduction and then maybe we'll stand up for a minute or two just so the people, so the people have been sitting for an hour or so, if that makes sense. Um, but John Eric Nelson is, is, uh, is our featured presenter of who I've, again, I've been involved with 20 years or so, and I've, I've ended up meeting him on both sides of uh, the Crown Point Road. I've been over at Fort Cobb, I've been at number four, where he's been involved. Uh, John, John grew up in Connecticut. Uh, he, was, uh, he, he was a Marine and served two tours in Vietnam back in, back in the good old days. Um, went on to become, a, had a career as a public school teacher in Connecticut, uh, but bought a summer home in, in Ticonderoga, so he's been coming up this way for many years. He's been a reenactor since the 1970s, or I guess they're called living historians now, right? So, uh, <laughs> um, and both, and specializing both in the French and Indian War and the American Revolution, both of which um, were conflicts in which the Crown Point Road played a prominent part. So John, being a student of history, has certainly studied the Crown Point Road for decades, and has put together presentations on it, and I asked him to put one together for us for today, and he graciously accepted, and uh, drove all the way up from Connecticut to be with us today. So, um, so I'm going to, so John, I hope that's a sufficient introduction. Um, um, do, do people want to stand up for one minute and maybe use visit the restroom before we get started? It's going to take me a minute just to stand up. Oh, yeah. So, uh, get more cookies. Get more cookies, and then we'll get going. This is a program I put together and gave a couple of times over at Fort Number 4 in Charlestown, New Hampshire. So forgive me if it's a little generic and toned down because giving programs over there, you have to go to the general public who has no idea. They're not even sure where Vermont, New Hampshire are, never mind where the Crown Point Road would be. So you're going to find it a little generic because most of you know more about this road than I do. So, And don't be bashful about telling me where I go wrong. I'm always willing to learn stuff, stuff after it's done. One of the interesting things in the middle when I start going through uh, a Connecticut provincial by the name of Webster, as he goes along the road, it's going to be repetitive, redundant, and you're going to go, oh man, why does he say the same thing again and again? Just picture what it was like for these folks. They go into the field in May and June. They march all the way from Connecticut, Massachusetts, wherever, to Albany, up to Lake George, and then they capture Ticonderoga and Crown Point. So when they start to go home in October and November, they've been in the field almost eight months. They've been out there fighting, in some cases, of digging forts and roads and etc. They're exhausted. All they want to do is get to the New Hampshire side at Fort Number 4, where they're going to get discharged, get their money, and then they can go home. So as we go through that redundant part, they're miserable. The weather's changing. It's cold. They're not happy. So keep that in mind as we go along. We are now in year six of the war in North America. It had not gone well until the end of last year, 1758, and then the turn for the British side start to take place. This year in 1759, the, the British are on their way to victory in North America. So, let's see, is this guy going to work now? Come on. There we go. Okay, so the physical movement of people, goods, information along the integrated transportation system was the central feature of 18th century uh, European and Indian societies in North America. This system encompassed an integrated web of rivers, paths, roads, villages, forts linking the Atlantic colonies to native settlements throughout the Northeast, even connecting two great empires. So that's the definition of what a road system would be. The Crown Point Road, um, or John Hawks Road, uh, was featured in a piece found in the uh, 2008 French and Indian War booklet that was put out by Historic Deerfield. It was one of many articles that have been published about this pathway through the wilderness of Vermont. Now, there are many routes that this pathway has taken over the years, as you well know. 
So there's a 59, the 60, you know, Farmer Jones moved it because it was closer to his barn and all that stuff. So when we look at the maps and the roads, and you guys try to figure out where the hell it went, it is all over the place, as you guys well know. Come on, cooperate. Yeah. Oh, let's go back. Skip that one. Anyway, and I apologize for that one. Um, it was built in 1759 to move men and supplies and cattle from New England to the war front in Lake Champlain. Sadly, much of the road is lost to us today. So, as you well know, that's probably what you see left. Um, we are left with only markers to point the way where the roadway was. Peoples who inhabited the continent in the 18th century offered identified water routes as the preferred method of uh, transportation. It was safe, fast, effective way to move people and goods. These were the superhighways of the 18th century, and that's critically important to understand. So the three major waterways uh, connecting New France and the uh, British colonies in the Northeast were the superhighways of the time. They were the Hudson, the Kennebunk, and the one we care about, the Connecticut River. These rivers were, and their tributaries were the most important part of the great transportation systems. Complementing these inland waterways were thousands of land routes of varying dimensions that connected along or ran along the sides of these waterways. These trails became important as portages and ways to travel when winter would cause travel by water to be disrupted. Now, starting with simple game trails uh, made by animals uh, moving to water or better feeding areas, particularly in the Northeast, it was the white-tailed deer. Soon these single path flaps, come on, cooperate. Oh, let me strip that. All right, these simple pathways uh, followed by Amerindians to find game, prime hunting grounds, water sources, and move their tribal communities. Europeans uh, came along and followed the same pathways through the wilderness. In time, these simple pathways became footpaths for military highways like the Forbes Campaign, the Braddock's Road Campaign uh, out in the Ohio Valley and eastern Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia. So, too, the Crown Point Road would be connecting Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Connecticut uh, with the war front and the Hudson, Lake George, Lake Champlain waterway. The Connecticut River. As Europeans began to push west and north from Boston and Connecticut, uh, they found the 18th century superhighway, the Connecticut River. Its 410 mile path runs north to south from the Long Island Sound, the Canadian border, along with its 148 tributaries that feeds into it from the east and west, made this network of highways a great transportation system in the early years of North America. Again, water transportation is the easiest, fastest way for people to move goods and themselves. This is particularly true for large armies that have to travel with all their equipment and supplies that needed to support themselves in the field. For this reason, it becomes critical to armies to be able to control the waterways. Some soon Settlements began to spring up along the shores. In 1740s, northernmost settlement was established on the east shore of the Connecticut River, just south of the junction with the Black River, known as the Fort at Number Four, now today Charlestown, New Hampshire. Come on. There we go. Okay, the route the Crown Point Road would follow was one of the daggers pointed at the heart of New England from Canada. From Kennaway, Kennesaw, and St. Francis, the native Indians would come down from their mission villages along the St. Lawrence River and strike into the heart, whether it was Deerfield or over by uh, Boston or on down uh, to Schenectady. These pathways would lead those Indians down in there and would become part of our, our pathways. These were the pathways that all these raiders would take from Canada, and in 1704, the siege of Fort Number Four, um, in 1704 in Deerfield, and the siege of Number Four in 1747, 
and a raid again in 1754, all used these pathways to come on down and attack. The route was used by captives and then taken back up to the villages up in the northern area. In August 1754, Susanna Johnson was taken from Fort Number 4 and led back up along the route that we now consider the Front Point Road. The trade route also from New France to the British colonies, number four, uh, English goods were better and cheaper than the French goods, so there was always this trading and at times of war, smuggling going back and forth between Canada and the British colonies uh, by Native Americans and uh, French and English traders. The pathway from number four um, to Crown Point was well known and used by early travelers. An account of a journey from Canada in 1748, quote, the said Clausen had often told me he did not believe the distance from number four to Crown Point across the country he has been diverse times was more than 96 miles as now commonly traveled and that he doubted not it might be shortened with advantage. He is a surveyor, critical, and careful in making his observations, John Williams. John Hawks uh, followed up with a similar comments. Otter Creek, five miles below a said Great Falls, where we crossed over the east side of the creek, the following of the foregoing 28 miles, good travel. We kept this course steady south by east from where we crossed the creek, 35 miles to above mentioned Black River, all the way on a beaten path. He used that word beaten path. Again, this was a this pathway was well known by a native for a long period of time. Uh, beaten pathways the Indians had made use of uh, upon the western frontiers of the provinces. We judged the whole to be less than 36 miles. We'll make a very good cart route. Several comments come out about making it into a cart route. Because if you're going to move an army or lots of supplies, you need a cart road, not just a footpath. And this cart path could be made with anything, nothing more than cutting a few trees away on the fall path, unquote. In 1754, a 22 year old captain in the Virginia military will light the world on fire. Become the Seven Years' War in Europe, the French and Indian War in North America. This would soon turn into a world war where two great empires would clash and fight for control of North America and all over the world. People always forget this. This war is a world war. It's the first, as Winston Churchill called the first uh, world war. The British colonies will engage in a struggle for North America. And those are just some of the places that the battles are breaking out across. The route used by both empires to raid and spy upon each other in September 1757, Colonel Nathan Whiting, commanding at Fort Number 4, writes to Lord Loudon, quote, As I have not ceased sending out scouts to reconnoiter the country, I shall, since my last return, had two scouts at Lake Champlain, the first, Lieutenant Pierce, with 14 men lay in sight of Crown Point, better part of two days. 12 boys in sight of Ticonderoga heard firing of 12 cannon, but not near enough to discover, unquote. Now, let me throw a caveat that I don't have on slides and I can't give to you now. Two years ago, I was in the Connecticut Historical Society. Nathan Whiting is somebody I've been studying. He's a guy from Connecticut. Went to Yale. He commanded troops in all the wars, 1745 all the way to 1765. He was in command of troops. And he is well beloved by people in Connecticut. But nobody's written a book about it. So I've been trying to write a book for 35 years. So I was up at the State Archives digging around and I found a, a file that said Mary Stoltenstall, well, that's his mother in law. I hadn't paid attention to it. Uh, and also, finally, I was bored one day up at the archives, and I opened up the folder, and sure as hell, there are five letters from Nathan Whiting that I had never seen before. For me, it was like finding the Holy Grail. 
But in that thing that pertains to what we're talking about today is there is a map. And the map reads, drawn for Colonel Nathan Whiting by Colonel Blanchard. Colonel Blanchard is the commanding officer of the New Hampshire Regiment's 3rd French and Indian War. It doesn't say the date, and there's no other information on it. But in my opinion, that was drawn for Colonel Whiting in 1757 when he's the commanding officer at Fort Number Four, and he's told, as these quotes I just read to you were, that he's constantly to send patrols up to St. Francis Indian Village, out to Crown Point, out to Ticonderoga, and this is a map that Colonel. Blanchard drew for him to show his scouts so that he could know what this route is. Now, I didn't bring it because I don't know what the province is. I don't, they don't know where it came from. We're trying to get in touch with somebody to find out where the map came from, how we got in the Connecticut Historical <coughs> Society. But if it's a true map, it, it sets the route that we're talking about, the Crown Point Road, also Rogers. It shoots Rogers Ray down on uh, St. Francis. It's a triangular map of route that they were taking. It'd be phenomenal if it's a true map. You know? We called it over the last two years. I haven't been able to do it. So anyway, that's something for us to get excited about later on down the line. Um, but it does have some pinpoint spots along the map. Um, so I diverted there, but I, I'm excited, and I think it's something that would really could open up some doors for us. Um, the quotes go on about uh, going up the same route with the three. Uh, so at Crown Point, a large encamp last night, Lieutenant Ferris came away from the lakes with five men. He imagined he was between two forts, saw neither nor any motion of the enemy. Came back in four days, so he, from there he's coming back across this route in four days. They reported the way to be good and, again, same quote that I mentioned before, that a road may pretty easily be made for carriages. Now, this is before 59s. So my point is that this is, they're thinking about this way before 1759 when Amherst sends them out there. So finally, in July 26, 1759, Fort Ticonderoga, or the French called it Fort Carillon, was blown up by the French and fell to Major General Jeffrey Ambert, the British. On August 1st, General Amherst arrived at Crown Point to find that the French had also blown up Fort St. Frederick, or Crown Point as the British called it, and moved further on north. The British began to build Fort Crown Point, which was going to be the largest fortification in North America at the time, until they got a new uh, director over there who destroyed the whole damn. I, sorry, I'm, you told me not to mention that. Um, they began to build a large fleet so they could gain control of the Lake Champlain and then invade Canada. It was not long after that Amherst ordered the construction of a road from Crown Point across Vermont to Fort Number Four on the Connecticut River. He wanted a better way to move troop supplies and improve communications with the war front and the New England coast. The old way across Connecticut, Massachusetts to Albany, basically Route 90 and Route 2, um, and then north up the Hudson River, was very hard on both men and animals and equipment. Soon after the fall at Crown Point, Amherst ordered a force of 200 rangers under the command of New Hampshire Ranger Captain John Starks to begin cutting a road from Crown Point to Number Four. This was to follow Otter Creek southeast and over the highlands to the Black River. The path that Starks cut in late summer of 1759 was just to be a rough cut and a blazed trail through the woods that it could only be used by foot traffic. It was to be improved by a follow-on force later on. Um, Amherst reports the following in his journal. 18 August sent 200 rangers to cut a road to open a communications from New England and New Hampshire to Crown Point. 
August 24th, Captain Johnson returned with his party from exploring Otter River. He found eight falls instead of the three most commonly known, um, and two very, very bad ones. The sides of the river are mostly part very swampy, and he says, impractical, impassable river as ever he saw. So Captain Johnson says that. 9th of September, Captain Starks returns with his party from Fort Number 4. 14 of his men had deserted, 6 had died, um, and 6 more were left behind because they were too sick. He said he had made a road and that there were no mountains or swamps to pass as he came back and measured 77 miles and maybe much sort of a discrepancy on the two scouting reports that are coming back. 12 September, ordered a detachment of 220 chosen men under the command of Major Robert Rogers to go and destroy the St. Francis Indian Settlement and French settlements on the south side of the St. Lawrence River. September 13th, Major Rogers sets up with his party. That's the famous Rogers Raid on St. Francis that they made the movie Northwest Passage with uh, Spencer Tracy and Robert Young that many of us have seen. Now, one of the important things on that, why I'm mentioning it is because two things are happening above the Crown Point Road. One, the British are probing up toward Montreal to the Richelieu River and trying to send scouts up as far up as they can to Chambly. And Rogers is on the 13th of September, is starting to cut across to move up the river, up the, excuse me, Lake Champlain to Miscoy Bay, then cutting across St. Francis and Brady. So the French and their native allies are busy over at Montreal with that force, and they find the boats of Rogers at Miscoy Bay, and now they don't know where he's hitting, but they're hunting for him. So they're tied up up here while Crown Point Road is being cut underneath, and I think that was one of the major things that really helped the road get um, put into place. On the 31st of October, Rogers will have completed his raid, returns from the raid, and arrives at Fort Number 4, and he comes within with just a few men, and the rest of his men are up at Wells River, um, up at the Amanusik River on the Connecticut River. He immediately sends supplies. They're starving on that raid, and you guys have probably all know about that raid and seen the movie. And again, I think that's important for us, from our point of view, is it's distracting the the French and their natives from coming down and pick on the people that are cutting the road. 23 September, I wrote to Brigadier Ruggles, Massachusetts Regiment, and Major General Lyon, Connecticut Regiments, that as the road was made to number four, I would be willing to send their troops to winter quarters the shortest way possible. If they approve of it, I would provide provisions accordingly and send their baggage and their sick by way uh, of water to Albany, and the rest can go across to number four on the new cut road. So that's the first time the road's really going to be used. September 24th, some fat oxen arrive for the army by way of number four. Much better order than the ones that had come up from the lakes. So already by the 24th of September, there's a herd of, of uh, oxen that had been driven from number four all the way across to Crown Point. And they show up, they're fatter, they're healthier than the ones that are coming up from Albany. So that just confirmed their idea. This was going to be a great idea, this road. On the 26th of October, with the campaign season coming to a close, Amherst orders the following. Major John Hawks of Massachusetts is to follow the Starks Trail to number four and then make the pathway into a road. So now they're going to go back and they're going to start cutting. Now, again, this is the redundant part, but picture. You've been out in the woods since June. You've been digging, fighting, you're cold, you're wet, you're tired, and now you've got to go across on this Road. But you don't get to just go, you've got to build a damn road as you're going. And this is, uh, most of this comes from Webster's and a few other Connecticut provincials as they go. And you kind of get a 
I get a sense of what they were feeling as they were stomping across, and winter is coming along the way. 26th October, I sent 250 men with proper tools under the command of Major Hawk to make the road to number four. Sent at the same time, Lieutenant Small with 30 men with arms to give provincials papers at number four to their homes and provisions at four pence per day. In other words, these guys are going to cut the road, march over to number four, and then when they get to number four, they get their pay and they get their discharges and then they're free to go home from there. And that's what uh, Small's going to do. Now he goes along the way. He's a British regular, by the way. Okay. Um, another journal on that same day, 26. Set out from Crown Point to go to number four and clear a road 20 feet wide. He had 250 men with him. This is Webster. 27th of October. On the road this day, we built two bridges. On the road this day, we sought out to clear the road and cleared a mile. So they went a mile one day at 250 men. This day, sought out and cleared road and cleared another mile. 28th of October, on the road this day, built one bridge and one causeway. This day cleared four miles, then camped. 29th of October, we built another bridge. We are in good health and high spirits. Cleared four miles. There's multiple journeys in, this, in these little quotes I'm giving you. 30 October, very cold and frosty. I ordered the provincials from Fort Edward and Post to join their regiments at Crown Point that they may go home by way of number four. So the troops that were at Ticonderoga marched up to Crown Point and then came across. So at that time, there must not have been a road connecting from Ticonderoga straight over. This day, we built a large bridge. This day, we built another bridge. We took two days allowance of fresh beef, all hands at work. We made a great bridge, marched three miles, and camped. October 31, last night it snowed. We made two bridges. You get a theme that they're doing a lot of bridge building here. Okay, this day very cold and was also very cold at night. One of November, first of November. We are in good health. We built one small bridge, passed through good land, all is well. Fifth of November, a pleasant morning. Yesterday was one of our... Yesterday, one of our men killed two deer. It clouded up and snowed. It rained all night. 6 November, this day, pleasant morning, we killed two cows. Our bread is just gone. We haven't had but one biscuit a day for this four or five days. Yesterday, we came to Otter Creek and are still there. We are very hungry. We sent 40 men back after bread, which we expected was on the road coming to us. This day we still lay still and then went to work without any bread to eat. Ebenezer Amendown killed a beaver with my hatchet. 8th of November, fair morning but cold. We made a bridge for footmen to go over our creek and went over and encamped on the other side of the creek. We haven't had any bread at all. 10 November, this morning we received one biscuit for four men. At Otter Creek still, we removed from Otter Creek toward number four, over three miles, then encamped. 11 November, a fair morning. We are at work, but haven't had any bread or salt in the last eight days. We live on fresh beef and water, some chaka leaf broth. Our men are very weak living in this form. I am not well. This day, eight of our men come to us with bread. We dined and felt better. 14th November, this day, we march and gain over the mountain and hills and swamps, almost tired to death. This night it rained. This day we finished our allowance. That means the food they had scheduled. This day the sick that came by number four overtook us. Uh, some of them... Um, it had taken that group of six men six days to reach this point. Now, they're not very far on the Crown Point Road yet. So the sick, they, had, they caught up to the sick guys that had been sent out already, and it took the sick guys six days, and they still have a long way to go. 
There's still uh, many days left of number four. 15th of November, 1759, in the woods. This day we marched from Black River with weary legs, guts, nothing to eat this day. All well this day. We traveled 12 and a half miles. 16 November. This morning we went to work and had nothing to eat. And this day we arrived at number four. So they get there on the 16th of November. And we ate a supper of beef and turnips. We are well. <laughs> this day Lieutenant Small warned us in order to let us go home. He's giving, say, okay, you guys are mustering out tomorrow. You're going to get your pay and you can go home. At 12 o'clock, we marched from number four, so they're on their way home. Winter conditions set in early that fall and hampered the work that could be done on the road. This, along with limited provisions, led to sickness, starvation, desertion by the troops. The last of the six and lame troops reached Fort Number Four on Christmas Day. So they were still coming across all the way until Christmas Day and were sent home from there. Early in December 1759, Lieutenant John Small dispatched a party of men to accompany Camp Captain Caleb Willard, a well-regarded surveyor, to search out a way suitable for carriages along a road that was just cut. Um, and some of you guys know about Small. He's a regular British, and he has just a bad report about what was being done to, as particularly the eastern side uh, of the uh, road at that time. Uh, Lieutenant Small reports to General Amherst they returned 20th of December and reported that they found a road and marked it out a much better way um, from number four beyond the heights of land in which they assuredly say uh, not interfere with the hill and gully and swamps but such as can be made practical for carriages. Um, on the 23rd of January 1760, Lieutenant Small summarized his last days of work on the road to General Amherst. Small complained about the eastern end of Captain Stark's route. Lieutenant Small, an experienced military engineer, was obviously at odds with Captain Stark's, as can be seen in the letter to Amherst. Quote, I was very sorry to see Captain Stark's or his party had for the last 14 or 15 miles marked the Crown Point Road across several high hills, steep rock precipices, deep gullies. In short, such inaccessible ground, I was conceived a better way, if not a good one, could be found if proper pains were taken to overtook it. Now, with Small's camp uh, complaints, you got to remember, again, these guys started in May. They've been in the field until October. October, they're starting to get destroyed, they're working on the road, it's cold, they're miserable, they're hungry, so, you know, the last 15 miles they're probably going, you want me to build another bridge? I don't want to build a bridge. <laughs> Campaign of 1760. Troops get mustered out. And beginning of 1760. In April of 1760, General Amherst wrote to Governor Wentworth describing his disappointment with the completion of the road to date and advising the governor that he intended to cut over anew the road according to Lieutenant Small's recommendations. Shortly thereafter, Amherst ordered the New Hampshire Regiment of 800 men under the command of Colonel John Goff to begin construction of a more suitable road beginning at the Connecticut River and proceeding west toward the Army at Crown Point. He's joined the Army there. Now, first thing, Governor Wentworth, these, all these guys, gee, politicians thinking about money. That's, that's, a, that's a new thing. Wentworth is sitting here saying, okay, the war's almost over. You want to cut a road right across New Hampshire from Merrimack, and we're going over to the Connecticut River, and that land is opening up. Gee, me and my buddies could probably buy some of that land for nothing. I'm a governor, I can do what I want. And then we'll land speculate and sell all that land out there. But we need a good road to do it. So he is going to take and have his men not only redo the Crown Point Road, but they're going to improve the road from Merrimack River over to the Connecticut River. Again, what does that do? Opens up all this territory for development. 
politician thinking about making money. I can't believe it. Governor Wentworth's route, as you can see here, is to clear and improve the roads from the Merrimack River at Litchfield, New Hampshire, to Keene, New Hampshire. Uh, Potter in his military history of New Hampshire says they had to clear the road, a mere bridle path from Merrimack to Keene at this point. In the Journal of Samuel McKintock, and you guys spelled that one, uh, in 1750 gives a great detail of this construction. 27 May, provisions were de uh, developed, uh, yeah, excuse me, delivered out to the several companies on order to proceed on their march across the river this evening. May 30th, the teams with baggage were sent off. Colonel Goff and I set off from Amherst in the afternoon and arrived that evening at one Butterfields at number two, now Wilton. A detachment under Captain Barry sent ahead to mend the road for the teams. Remember, this road's a mess. It's not really a road. May 31, a new detachment was sent out early in the morning under Lieutenant Stevens to clear and mend the road for the teams. Some new teams were procured at Petersburg about nine miles, passed through what is called the notch of Pakmanenok. That's Mount Mananok. There's a gap in there. A uh, considerable ridge of mountains stretching from north to south. The land from number two to Petersburg, very mountainous and rocky. It was with great difficulty that teams got through, a number of the soldiers being obliged to lift at the wheels a great part of the way. 2 June, set off early this morning with Mr. Small for Keene. Had a very tedious day's journey, the road being exceedingly rough, rocky, mountainous, in some places we had to climb up and then descend very steep precipices. In other places, the mud was so deep up that our horses' bellies, from Petersburg to Keene, the way we came, reckoned about 25 miles. 3 June, left Keene this morning, traveled about 12 miles through the woods to a place called the Great Meadows, which is now Westmoreland. The land is very good, but the way is rough and uneven. One of the things you notice in all these journals, they keep talking about how the land is. In their minds, they're thinking, gee whiz, nobody really owns this land. It's pretty good. The dirt's pretty good. Maybe we could buy it. We could have farms out here. And that's going to help. And the land uh, the way is rough, uneven, before we stop traveling eight miles further at Bellows, Major Bellows, which is now Bellows Falls, if you are familiar with that area. We dined, and in the afternoon rode up to Fort Number 4, 10 miles thence. And from the Great Meadow, the road lies near the side of the river. At Number 4 lives about 30 families, compact, several houses standing within the principal fort. This march took seven days to complete from the Merrimack to Fort Number 4. On the 16th of June, I marched um, from Number 4 up the Connecticut River three miles and then crossed the river and encamped. And we built a blockhouse on the riverside, that's the west side, where Wentworth Ferry was located. We got one of our markers is over there with, with that. that, which you can see there. And we just I think you replaced it a couple years ago, right? You had it because it, the plaque got stolen, the rat's plaque got stolen. Um, the marker, uh, we also had to build a large scow and some canoes to get across the river. And then it went to work upon the road towards Crown Point, returning every night. So they're staying at that blockhouse right by that ferry landing. Uh, and then they kept going out and coming back, because that was our main camp of supplies. Um, returning each night until the 28th of the month. And that's the, uh, the marker up there. 6th July, uh, they camped and marched forward north on the bran uh, north branch of the Black River, which is about five miles. July 7th, the axemen cleared nearly two miles, but finding that they should meet with great difficulty, but much detained in making the road over the mountain, and having found an easier passage, there's an example of them changing the route in 60 compared to 69. On the north side of the mountain, they quit the road and struck off on a new one about 
three quarters of a mile from the encampment. July 8th through the 11th, they're still working on the road. It should be noted that they were making changes in the route as they went along. This happens many times that they found easier, shorter paths to follow. So there's a lot of change taking place in 1760 uh, compared to the rough cut that was done in 59. 13 July, men working this day, they have on every Sabbath. So they're working on Sabbath. The New Englanders don't like to work on Sabbath. There's always fights during this war about men having to work on the Sabbath. So they're making them work on the Sabbath to cut this road. A party of 30 men uh, set off to find a way by Black River to the Otter Creek. Along the way, uh, they have to make causeways. This is an example of a quarter red road. Uh, I don't know if you, I know, I see them in New York all the time, but they just lay the logs in the swamp here so the wagons can get over. Um, just very simple. That, that's a picture of an old one that's in the Adirondacks over there. Uh, part of the regiment at work on the road finishing bridges and causeway. Uh, 25 July, a party of 110 set off with Captain Willard to mark the road to Otter Creek and cut down brush. 27th of July, main body of the regiment marks 12, uh, 12 o'clock for Crown Point, traveling our road on the southernmost of uh, the Black River Ponds. Does anybody know where, you guys know where the Black River Ponds are? Okay. That's one I don't know. You have to have a tour. Okay. <laughs> and then it's, uh, two and a half miles to Hawks Road. So they're leaving, cutting a new road, and cutting, continually come back to the one that uh, Hawks cut the year before. 29 July, advance two miles beyond Otter Creek. Land on Otter Creek, extraordinarily good. They're saying that all the time, which is interesting. 31 July, arrived on the east shore of Lake Champlain, opposite Crown Point, three o'clock. Cross to the point in Bateau. So they get they get to Crown Point there. They have been working on the road for 45 days. So when they, from the time they left Merrimack to the time they get to Crown Point, it's over a month. It's 45 days. Making the road wider, better, finding the easiest route, adding camps, cattle pens along the way. They cut the road. And they also began cutting a road over to Fort Ticonderoga. So they didn't have to go up and down, they just got across. Um, they joined the rest of the army at Crown Point and moved north to the capture of um, Montreal. And on September 8, 1760, the governor of Canada, the Marquis de Vaudreuil, surrendered Montreal with it all of French Canada. This ended the French and Indian War in North America. The war on the rest of the world would rage for two more years. In the fall of 1760, New England provincials once again marched home over Crown, uh, the Crown Point Road, and from thence they were discharged to their service. Campaign of 1761 and 62, um, the Connecticut provincials were raised again, and again they marched north over the Crown Point Road, up to Crown Point. These troops were to continue building what they, at that time, was the largest fortification in North America at Crown Point. At the same time, uh, at, at the, the same way that the Forbes Road and the Braddock Road out into western Pennsylvania was a road that opened up expansion uh, for settlers, the Crown Point Road also opened up the Hampshire and the New Hampshire Grants, soon to be Vermont, to the northern expansion. Canada was now in British control. The whole of the Northeast was open for settlement. In many ways, the Crown Point Military Road would lead to a land rush in the North Country. Factors leading to settlement in the North Country, New Hampshire, Vermont, upstate New York. The war had come to the end on the 10th of February, 1763 the World War. Peace had ended the threat of Indian raids and French raids from Canada. The war had caused great debt inflations in the colonies, so there was trouble with money. Land along the coast was already taken and very, very expensive. 
The proclamation of 1763 said that there could be no more western expansion past the Appalachian Mountains. They wanted to keep that land for the Indians and the white guys on the eastern side of that. And that meant, suddenly, if you can't go west, but there's free land to the north, the north comes into play. Quote, our governors of seven provinces on the continent of North America to grant without fee or reward to such officers as have served in North America during the late war and to such private soldiers that have been or shall be disbanded in America the following quantities land. So the British government is going to start doing land grants all over the place in lieu of paying the guys. To everyone having the rank of field officer, 5,000 acres. To a captain, 3,000. To a subaltern, 2,000. To an NCO, 200. To a private soldier, 50 acres. The Board of Trade, cutting Connecticut out of the Ohio land grant, if you take a ruler and put it at the top of Connecticut and the bottom of Connecticut, Connecticut's charter claimed land all the way until the Pacific Ocean they didn't know about it there. But Ohio was part of Connecticut. They thought it was. They were fighting with Virginia and Pennsylvania over that land. And finally, the British government said, no, Connecticut can't have that land. The land up here is cheap and it's free in some cases. For most importantly, the story told by the men on their way home in their journals that we read, land, rich, soil, good, etc., spurred their interest. So there's a land rush out of Connecticut. There's just a ton of Connecticut people coming up north. Same thing's happening in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Some of the journal entries that the men wrote that, uh, and stories they would tell back in Connecticut. The land back of the intervale, in general, dry, barren, pitch pine, plain, land in general rocky, uneven, but middling good soil. The soil between Amherst and number two, pretty good. Very mountainous and rocky, but the soil exceedingly rich. Wood, very thick and large, chiefly maple, oak, beech, white birch, intermixed some pine and hemlock. North branch of the Black River, the land exceedingly good, rich, bears great, large timber, chiefly beech, maple, hemlock. Near a small brook, the land all the way exceedingly good. The land on Otter Creek, exceedingly good. There are plenty of nut trees and limestone. And these descriptions we found in many of the journals kept by the troops coming back and they had marched along the Crown Point. These tales of uh, good land to the north are saying basically come out and take us. Connecticut officers in 1761 and 62 would not serve anywhere in North America except at Crown Point. And Governor Fitch, the governor of Connecticut, reported to General Amherst in 1761 that the Connecticut officers absolutely refused to serve anywhere else but at Crown Point. And finally, Amherst granted their wish. Why do they want to do that? They saw how good that land is. They're up there, the war's over, and now they're just building that fort. So they're spending their time, and they talk about it in their journals, going out and checking all the land along Lake Champlain. And as they march up over the mountain, they're out there going, hmm, that would be a good ranch for me. Hey, Tom, that looks like a good chunk of land for you. Why don't you take that? And that's what they're doing in their journals. Land grants for former soldiers. All the New England officers band together and write a letter to General Amherst asking for his aid in getting land grants. They're doing this. This letter is in November 10th, 1759. So this is just after they get over the floor and they marched over the road. Not that governors would get money, but true, soldiers, officers, they, maybe we could get some money. So they write, all these officers from New England band together and they write General Amherst. And they write, Crown Point Camp, November 10th, 1759. To His Excellency, Jeffrey Amherst, the French are entirely dispossessed of large tracts of land southwest of the line from Crown Point to number four, which will not be of much value unless inhabited. In order to give the strongest assurance of our loyalty and zeal for the services aforementioned, 
we beg leave to offer our further services for the settlement of townships along that line. Each battalion, at proper distances, making the new cut road the center of each township as the most effectual way of preventing incursions of the Indians into our country. We're going to do that for you, dear King. We're going to be really helpful citizens. If His Majesty would be graciously pleased to make grants of said lands. So these guys are like, okay, the war is almost over. We saw that nice land. You know what? We're going to go service. We're going to help you out, Mr. King. We're going to inhabit all this Vermont for you. We're going to help you out. Amherst writes back and agrees that he will <clears throat> promise to forward their request to the king. On 26 January 1770, uh, former Colonel Nathan Whiting, um, during, uh, who was the uh, Connecticut commander of the 2nd Connecticut Regiment during French and War, was granted a tract of land that lay on the west side of the Connecticut River and known by the name of the township of Cumberland, Vermont. This was the second patent or charter that was issued by the Colony of New York to Colonel Whiting. The first was issued in 1767 to Colonel Whiting and his associates for a plot of land six miles square to be named Whitingham. And the name it still holds today, Whitingham, Vermont. This was for their fidelity to the king's service. Whiting uh, shares, uh, share was 3,000 acres. So that's an example of them actually getting these land grants up, up here. And again, why? Because they came across this road that you guys are trying to preserve so much. In later years, the Crown Point Road would see service again as a military road during the American Revolution. Once again, it would be used to move troops and equipment from Crown Point and Ticonderoga. Road with Hubbardton Military Road would be added, which would help the American troops get away from the British after the loss of Fort Ticon Road. The path of the Crown Point Road would be moved and changed many times over the years from its start in 1759. But after the war, the Crown Point Road would continue to move people and goods as the state of Vermont continues to grow and develop. So with all this history that has taken place on this pathway through the wilderness, we cannot let this road through the woods be lost nor forgotten. And to that end, in 2002, a reenactment group of younger, more foolish young reenactors um, decided that they were going to march over the Crown Point Road in total 18th century style. <coughs> so on August, in August of 17, uh, yes, <laughs> wrong decade, son. <laughs> 2002, nine members of the reenacting group Rogers Rangers began a march on the Crown Point Road. We started, there was a reenactment on the weekend, and when the reenactment ended on Sunday afternoon, at four in the afternoon, at fort number four, we followed the uh, French and Indian War reenactment with our march. We were rowed across the Connecticut River, past the bridge, and landed where the old block house and where Wentworth Ferris was landed. Uh, we marched across Vermont for five days. We camped totally 18th century in our little sleeping canvas bags, <clears throat> ate food by the fire and all that good stuff, and we camped 18th century the whole way. People were very kind to us along the way, bringing us water, food, and letting us lay on, on, on their land and camp there uh, overnight. We marched through Rutland, and we found that this is the most amazing story. We marched through Rutland, and we looked behind us, and there was a cop car following us. And it seems that some lady had called up and said, there's a group of men marching through Rutland, Vermont, with guns. <laughs> the cop pulls up, and as soon as he sees us, he knows what we're doing because he was at the reenactment that Sunday. <laughs> and he's a reenactor, and he was going to do the one on the next weekend at Crown Point. He pulls up, and he tells us the story. He goes, first of all, I had a laugh. A woman says, there's guys marching through Vermont with guns. Everybody 
everybody in Vermont marches to Vermont with guns. So what's the big deal? But I gotta check it out. And once I saw you do exactly what you were doing, that guy was great. So in the meantime, a reporter from the Rutland newspaper is hears about this guys with guns, police heading off to head him off on his scanner. He comes driving up. By that time, we were all shaking hands. We were ready to continue our march down the road. And the guy said, I gotta get pictures of, of this for the paper. And I don't have the picture. I, I went back to the library, I went back to the newspaper. They don't have it. But they had us all on our, putting our chins on the tops of our muskets like this. And then the policeman standing there with his hand on his gun pointing at us. And they got that picture. <laughs> I saw the picture, but I don't have it. I, I tried to get it out of the newspaper. But it was great. And the cop was a great guy. A few miles down the road, he brought us ice cream and sodas for later. <laughs> And the damn march, it was 98 degrees almost every day. This is the uh, what was in the Rutland newspaper. Um, and once the newspaper came out on when, uh, Thursday morning, from that point on, people were cheering us, happy. They were giving us cookies and lemonades we went. We march by a field, we see the guy in with his tractor, and he roars out of the field with his tractor at 100 miles an hour, down the road in front of us, kicking up dust, and about a mile down the road, he's out there with his kids, and he asks, can we get pictures with you guys? And we saw in the paper, people go by and walk. So the newspaper article was really good as we marched uh, on our way. And there's some more of the newspaper article, just marching down the road here. Uh, we followed the markers as much as we could, wherever we, and using your guidebook, um, we could follow it. We were in the woods and on trails. The Rutland part is the worst part. We basically, you have to go down the road if you couldn't do any other way. Um, so we would follow the markers as, as, as we could. And it was a real treat um, to be shown the cattle pens. Um, we, People would show us where they, they thought the cattle pens were, uh, where they would be penned up as they would be driven. So we got to see some of those from people throughout. Anytime we came to a marker or a grave site, we would stop and um, honor those who had passed before us who had died along the trail. So anytime we saw a marker, there's cemeteries along the way, we would uh, mourn our muskets and fire up volley over the, over the graves, and so forth. And that's just us with one of the, toward the end of it. We, we get to what we think is going to be about 18 miles to go on Thursday night. So friends of ours who brought us venison stew and beer and everything else, we're camped over in in this cornfield, and we're celebrating, we're having a few beers, and we go, ah, oh, we're finished tomorrow, i got 18 miles to go tomorrow, this is a piece of cake. All of a sudden, we're looking at our map, we lost a section of the map. We're missing a section. So we get a, a map out and we calculate. So instead of 18 miles, it's 33 miles we have to do. So we decide we got to do it because people are expecting us Friday night at Crown Point. So we get up and we're marching in the dark and, and there and we finally get, um, get to Crown Point and we're three, last day, long hot, 33 miles and the end is near. And then finally we reach Crown Point, what a sight. Sore eyes, sore feet, but we we're so damn proud we made it. At last. <laughs> the next morning we were like we were rowed across on the Connecticut River. The next morning, Saturday morning, and there's a big reenactment going on at Crown Point. Uh, they row us across from Chimney Point, they row us across to Crown Point, and they got the whole camp out. There's several hundred reenactors on the sideline as we're getting rowed across, and they, they're all lined up waiting for us to land, and the whole camp turns out for us uh, Saturday morning. 
We're tired, we're sore, but we're happy and proud. This week-long event allowed us a chance to relive what provincial soldiers did in 1759-1760. But we did not have to go to work on the road along the way. We didn't have to go hungry. We didn't have to worry about being scalped. Now, I usually end the thing here, but um, when I do, do the program over four, I promote you guys a lot. So I do this talking about Crown Point Road and all the things you guys do, the hikes and stuff. Hey, here's my buddy Nick Westbrook. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, one question for you. From yeah. the beginning, you mentioned publication by Stark Deerfield and John Hawks. Yes. Is John Hawks from Deerfield? No, he's a Massachusetts guy. But he was over. Well, uh, Deerfield Plants. Yes. yes. He, was, he was from Deerfield. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you know, yes. I was thinking he was over by Amherst, but no. No, I, I lived there for 30 years yeah. before I came here. Yeah. Yeah. He was. Right. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah. My brain's not working anymore. <laughs> this, yeah. this old age civility is killing me. <laughs> yeah, he was. And it's important to understand that when Starks cuts the road, he's just. It's like you and I going in the woods and we pack a, a blaze on a tree. They're just. They're cutting down minimal stuff, and they're just basically cutting away. And then it's Fox that's actually building the things. He comes through with his next 250 men. And then actually they really improve it, coming the 800 New Hampshire guys coming the other way. Now, in 1755, up earlier in the 1750s, New Hampshire wanted to go and Fort Number Four in Charlestown, New Hampshire, was the northernmost settlement. But New Hampshire had been talking about punching up to the Coos area, just below the Wells River and the Amanusik River, where it comes on the Connecticut River, where Wells Mass uh, Vermont is today. And they were going to build Fort Number Five, and it was going to be in that area. So they'd been talking about it for about ten years, and. Um, in 1755, um, Governor Wentworth orders uh, the uh, New Hampshire guys, instead of going over to Albany, then up to, to fight the Battle of Lake George in 55, he orders them to go up the Connecticut River and establish a fort up at where the Coos are, and that would be Fort Number Five. And they've been wanting that for years because they thought. Number one, it would be a fortified barrier to keep the French and Indians coming down from St. Francis and from over um, Montreal. And then when, if a war breaks out, and this was the last of the Seven Years' War, they didn't, about every 15 years they'd have a war in North America between France and England. That would be a, a major base to launch attacks toward Montreal or up toward Quebec. So they wanted a base there. And they also wanted a base there for trading, make trading easier. So the Indians and French didn't have to come all the way down to the before they could be up there. So 55 went for sends the Hampshire Regiment up that way. It gets all screwed up. They end up coming back down, and then they have to go to Albany to come up. And they get to the Battle of Lake George late. They don't even get in the battle until the next day. So um, this road and the ideas of cutting the road and doing all this stuff was on their minds for a long, long time. It just didn't pop in somebody said in 59. Yes, ma'am? We, uh, we did the Crown Point Road hike in 09. It was, and it's just amazing. We went from Crown Point to Fort Number 4. Uh-huh. It's hard that you think Vermont's a mountainous area. Well, there was hardly any climbing. That route was just no climbing. It's just one little section. It's just amazing. Well, you want the easiest way you can. Yeah. You know. And they found it. Yeah. You know, and especially if you're bringing, you're bringing cattle and you're bringing wagons. You know, I mean, and you know the, why they're moving it so much. You know, uh, great. Uh, books on the Braddock Road. Braddock, when he's cutting the road from uh, Virginia over to Pittsburgh, basically, they're making a mile a day. And he's got thousands of guys working. But, I mean, it's hard to cut a road and move, you gotta move the rocks, you gotta cut the stumps down so the wagon wheels will go over it. 
and the horses are running and dying on the way. And, you know, it's not easy cutting roads in the wilderness. And these people are making decisions, uh, the generals and the governors and the kings and all this, they don't know what's out here. And when Braddock comes in 55, he thinks it's going to be a one-day march to get to Pittsburgh from Virginia. Oh, we just cut a road and we'll just march over there. First, we'll just sail our boat up to Susquehanna, which you can't. It's too shallow. And then we'll just march a day and we'll be in Pittsburgh. They don't know. You know, and the same thing up here. You know, they get Indians. Well, yeah, there's a little mountain there. You can go over there. You know, it's Mount Washington. You know, they don't know. They didn't have races back then. I'm sorry? They didn't have WRXs on nice flat roads back then. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and I think the thing that I, as somebody, a living historian, somebody interested in history, and what you guys do is so important. I mean, just from the human perspective, think about what it was like. You know, well, they're whining and complaining. Well, they're starving. I mean, they had one biscuit for four guys. Think about that. You know, we, were, we had more food here today <laughs> than they had the whole trip. <laughs> they would have been happy as hell. You know, and they, it's, it's getting, you know, it's October, November, it's starting to rain, it's frost in the morning, you know. All I know is I was glad I had a furnace in my camper yesterday, you know, when it, about two this morning when I had to go uh, to the bathroom and I got out from under all those blankets, I got all of the cow, I quickly turned that furnace on, you know, and, but they're out there with just a little blanket laying on the ground. It's raining, snowing, and now they got to do physical labor of cutting, building bridges, cutting roads, moving rocks, and travel. Right. And then, of course, you got the threat of somebody coming out of the woods and scalping you, too. It didn't happen, but it's the threat still there. Any other comments or thoughts, or anybody you want to add to something I goofed up? No. I think I was great. Um, once again, thank you so much for doing yeah. this. I'm going to around and sure packing up if anybody has any questions in the chat. And we can do the same and safe trip home. Uh, board will start meeting and planning things for next year. No rest for the week. <laughs> and if you guys are all built up before I get myself put away and head out, everybody have a wonderful, safe winter. Enjoy. We'll see you guys. The board comes up with wonderful trips for next year.